Last week, we covered the epic conclusion to the Battle of Attu, as Colonel Yamaseki's doomed garrison made a last Banzai charge towards salvation that ended in mass death. But most importantly, the end of the battle would have huge repercussions for the North Pacific campaign, as the Japanese now had no other choice but to abandon their presence in the Aleutian Islands. At long last, the population of the US could feel safe again. Further south, however, we also have in store some new developments that were unfolding in China and the Solomons, so join us as we delve into another exciting episode of the Pacific War. This video is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and YouTube members. They get exclusive videos weekly. Right now, the patrons and YouTube members have 30 videos to choose from, with series on the Peloponnesian War, Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, and History of Prussia. You can join their ranks by pressing the Join button under the video, or use the link in the description and pinned comment to watch exclusive videos, access our member-only Discord, see our schedule, and get early access to the public videos. Thanks for supporting us! After the end of the Battle of Attu, all that remained on the tiny island were the piles of Japanese bodies left behind by the carnage. The Americans had also suffered substantial casualties, as this had been the costliest ground battle yet fought in the Pacific. But most of them were still alive, whereas the entire garrison of Colonel Yamasaki had been wiped out entirely. Nonetheless, although many costly mistakes had been committed, the lessons taught during the battle were numerous and important. American commanders learned about the fanaticism and willingness to die of the Japanese, finding them to be masters at camouflage, concealment, and infiltration, but also discovering their many weaknesses at all-around defense. Most importantly, however, planners began to conceive and take into account that weather and terrain posed the greatest threat to success, something that would prove to be invaluable in future operations. As we'll recall, while the Battle of Attu raged, the Japanese had issued a directive on May 21st for the evacuation of Kiska's almost 6,000 soldiers, primarily by submarine, but also calling for the use of surface ships, weather permitting. If possible, the Attu garrison was to be rescued as well, although time would prove that this would not be the case. Fearing an attack against the northern Kuriles, the directive also addressed its defenses, it called for the deployment of fighters and anti-aircraft units to provide air defense and shore batteries to protect against an amphibious invasion, also requiring improvements in the infrastructure of Paramashiro. The Japanese submarine evacuation of Kiska began on May 27th, as the I-7 arrived at Kiska with food, ammunition and a radio beacon. The submarine took aboard 60 passengers, mostly sick and wounded. 28 boxes of ashes of those who died on the island, and 4 tons of spent shell cartridges. Other I-class submarines managed to make it through the blockade, but the attrition rate proved too costly. Admiral Kawase himself considered that it would take 40 or 50 round trips to evacuate the entire Kiska garrison. As the Japanese didn't have enough time for that, they began planning a surface evacuation. In the meantime, the Americans had also carried out the simultaneous invasions of the islands of Shemya and Igatu, in which Brigadier General John Copeland led a landing force that included elements of General Buckner's 4th Regiment and Colonel Talley's 18th Engineers. Going ashore at Shemya in a tough storm, the Americans were to survey the little island for the building of the first attack airfield expressly designed to accommodate the experimental new long-range B-29 Super Fortress Heavy Bomber. With their usual blinding speed, the American engineers would make the Attu Air Station operational by June 8th, and would further activate the Shemya airfield two weeks later. Additionally, the 11th Air Force would be reinforced with squadrons of the new PV-1 Ventura bombers, equipped with the latest airborne radar, which gave a clear picture of topographical contours that would be of much use in the Arctic weather and at nighttime. Admiral Kincaid would also reinforce the Kiska blockade with an impenetrable screen of destroyers, cruisers and battleships. Throughout June, General Butler's forces would plaster Kiska while the enemy carried out its evacuation. Flying a total of 407 bombing sorties, 
although the formidable Japanese arsenal of around 70 anti-air batteries would have much success hindering the job of the airmen with their withering accuracy. Uncontested, the Americans would make further unopposed landings on Senesipochmoy and the Rat Islands, covered only by PT boats. With the new Atu and Shemya bases, they also now had sufficient range to bomb Paramashiro, the huge Gibraltar-like base that guarded the northern approach to Japan, so a new raid would be scheduled for July. After two unsuccessful attempts, the Americans would finally manage to bomb Paramashiro on July 18th. Though the six B-24 Liberators would not inflict any serious damage, the raid proved to the Japanese that their home soil was no longer immune to attack so the Empire could no longer depend on distance or its solution bases to act as a buffer. Forced to reinforce the Kuriles and Hokkaido, the Japanese would have to move out men, guns, ships and planes from the Solomons and the Philippines, leaving those places considerably weakened. Meanwhile, because of the success that they were having, Buckner and Kincaid saw their budget increase exponentially as the Joint Chiefs approved the preparation of an invasion of Japan from the Aleutians, setting the date of the invasion to early 1945. Still, Kiska would first have to be subdued, so it will continue to cover the North Pacific theatre in the future. But now we have to venture back to China, where the Battle of West Hubei was about to enter its final phase. As we last saw, the 11th Army of General Yokoyama had successfully reduced the Chinese presence in West Hubei, south of the Yangtze River, only leaving them with their defensive positions south and southwest of Yichang, particularly at the Shipai Fortress. Manned by the 11th Chinese Division of General Hu Lian, the Shipai Fortress was located over the dangerous Xiling Gorge, which made it a formidable defensive point, guarding the entrance to Chongqing and Sichuan. Because of its importance, Chen Cheng would order Hu Lian to defend the fortress to the death. By May 18th, as the second phase of the operation south of the Yangtze came to its conclusion, General Yokoyama decided to concentrate the 13th Division near Chuanshui Wan and the 3rd Division, reinforced with the Nozoe Detachment near Xuanjing Si, in preparation for their final drive to destroy the Chinese forces located between Yichang and Yidu. The following day, the first and last phase of the operation started, with the 13th Division immediately moving north, while the reinforced 3rd Division advanced into the area south of Yichang to cross the Qingjiang River. The invaders found some enemy positions along the way, but so many casualties had already been inflicted on the Chinese troops that the defenders were dazed and easy to overcome. Nonetheless, the efforts of the 18th Army would manage to slow down the Japanese advance, forcing Yokoyama to direct his 39th Division to join the offensive. On the early hours of May 22nd, the 39th thus forded the Yangtze and joined the 3rd Division in their assault of Changyang. But as the enemy was gradually approaching the Shipai Fortress from three directions, Cheng Chang and General Sun Lian Zhang decided to throw the 94th and 32nd Armies to stop the 13th Division's advance at Yuyangquan. Chen Cheng's plan was solid, as if it succeeded, the Japanese were going to be flanked and surrounded. But instead, as Yokoyama's units clashed with the main force of the 18th Army at Changyang and Yuyangquan on May 23rd, the confused and demoralized defenders were rapidly sent packing before the 94th and 32nd Armies could arrive at the battlefield. Fortunately, however, the Chinese would manage to reorganize and establish new defensive positions to the right of the Shipai Fortress, successfully setting up a last line of defense in front of Chongqing and Sichuan. Yet the enemy relentlessly continued its advance, and by the end of May 26th, it had reached the hastily assembled Chinese line. At this point, General Yokoyama considered that the main objective of the operation had been completed, as the vessels at Yichang could now advance towards Yuyang without facing any opposition. Thus, he would order the 53 ships to navigate the river on May 27th, although he would be surprised by the unexpected appearance of Allied aircraft, which started to bomb and strafe the ships on the Yangtze and the troops on the ground. Meanwhile, at the Shipai Fortress, Hu Lian faced the direct attacks of a Japanese regiment on May 28th. Fighting to the death, the desperate defenders would manage to repel each enemy assault, successfully inflicting many casualties on the invaders. Hu Lian would personally supervise the troops at all times in their efforts to dig in and build fortifications. 
but to the right, the 3rd and 39th Divisions also charged against the new positions manned by the exhausted soldiers of the 18th Army, who resisted as fiercely as they could. But they were no match against the full might of two Japanese divisions, rapidly seeing two companies get annihilated as the invaders pushed them back. Nonetheless, the 18th Chinese Division of General Luo Guangwen boldly decided to counterattack, launching a rain of grenade and mortar fire over the positions of the invaders that decisively checked the attacks of the 3rd and 39th Divisions. Although the aid of the artillery and air bombardments would manage to slow down the Japanese advance, time was of the essence if they hoped to defeat the enemy. Thankfully, the 94th and 32nd armies finally arrived in the area, with the 94th army successfully blocking the advance of the 13th division near Dayanshang, thus forcing the invaders to cross the dangerous Tianjin mountain, where they would lose much of their equipment. But coming down the road, the 13th Division would also be ambushed by the concealed forces of the 32nd Army, which managed to inflict hundreds of casualties on the unsuspecting Japanese. Because of these losses, and seeing his forces unable to break through, Yokoyama would order the Noji Detachment at Yichang to cross the Yangtze and directly attack the Shipai Fortress in a last effort to overcome Hu Lian's defences. On May 29th, the Noji Detachment finally launched its attack, breaking through Hulien's line at Chu Chenping and inflicting heavy casualties on the bloodied 11th Division, which was forced to retreat towards the bay. Similarly, by the end of the day, the 18th Army's other units had to withdraw, leaving Hulien alone to face the brunt of the Japanese offensive. Yet at this point, the Japanese had suffered huge losses, the vessels at Yichang had already arrived at Shishou, and Yokoyama was afraid that his remaining forces would get trapped by the Chinese armies that had moved to Changyang. Because of these reasons, he would finally order the end of the operation on May 29th, preparing his troops to withdraw two days later. Yet on May 30th, the 13th Division decided to attack Mu Chaochi, not knowing that the 32nd Army had set up another ambush there. Firing violently, the Chinese defenders would inflict many more casualties on the battered division. Similarly, the isolated 11th Division would at the same time repel the combined attacks of the 3rd and 39th Divisions, repulsing a total of 10 consecutive attacks throughout the day, and leaving the bay full of Japanese bodies. The following day, as the Japanese began to retreat, Chinese reinforcements would arrive at the battlefield, and together they would launch a fierce counterattack. While the 3rd and 39th avoided any damage as they crossed the Yangtze at Yichang, the exhausted and weary 13th Division was ordered to head towards Yidu, and was finally trapped by the 32nd Army at Changyang on June 3rd. Although it would eventually break through towards Gong'an, the 13th Division, which had been earmarked to depart for the Pacific in the near future, lost so many men during this battle that it would have to remain in China. Meanwhile, Yokoyama would have to send the 17th Independent Mixed Brigade to rescue the trapped division. Arriving at Gong'an on June 5th, the brigade would fight a long series of fierce battles until they would finally be able to withdraw with the remnants of the 13th Division on June 8th. During the next few days, the Chinese forces of Chen Cheng and Sun Lianzhong would successfully recapture most of the lost territory and would begin to rebuild their destroyed and looted fortifications and villages. Although the original objective of the operation had been successful, the Japanese reported that they suffered more than 3,500 casualties during this battle, with 771 dead and 2,746 wounded. Yet it's disputed that they actually suffered tens of thousands of losses, as the 13th Division was practically destroyed while the strength of the 17th Mixed Brigade and the 3rd and 39th Divisions was severely damaged. So many were the casualties inflicted that the Japanese would be unable to start another offensive in China until the end of the year. In any case, the Chinese celebrated this strategic victory as the gateway to Chongqing and Sichuan had been successfully and tenaciously defended by the brave soldiers of the 18th Army. Now it's time to move to the Solomons, where the Americans continued to prepare for their next offensive. As we last saw, the Japanese had conducted Operation Ego, a massive air counter-offensive that had managed to cause some damage on the main Allied bases established in the South Pacific. Yet the damage inflicted had not been enough, 
so the invaders knew that they would need to carry out more operations like Ego if they hoped to pin down the Americans and prevent them from launching more offensives in the South Pacific. Even worse, the most important commander of the IJN, Admiral Yamamoto, had been killed on April 18th, completely shattering the Japanese morale at Rabaul. Nonetheless, Admiral Kasaka would set out to reorganize, repair and reinforce his air forces in preparation for what he believed to be an incoming American offensive against the Central Solomons. Since the evacuation of Guadalcanal, it's important to note that the Japanese had set out to build a strong defensive line in the Central Solomons, and for that, they would need to reinforce all bases in Santa Isabel and New Georgia using large transports. Kuska's envisioned main defense force was Rear Admiral Ota Minoru's 8th Combined SNLF, which comprised the Kure 6th and the Yokosuka 7th. By late January, Ota's unit had begun its movement to New Georgia, successfully arriving at Munda by the end of the month, although a heavy air attack on January 28th would manage to destroy 75 barge loads of valuable cargo, and the Japanese would also send some various forces to occupy Villa and Rakata Bay in January establishing some light defences in these new bases. By late February, however, the destruction of the Kirikawa Maru would force the Japanese to rely only on destroyers, deeming the cargo ships as unfeasible. Additionally, the Battle of Blackett Strait on March 6th would force them to avoid the Kula Gulf and instead use the Ferguson Passage. Thereafter, throughout the rest of March, April and early May, the Japanese suffered only one loss, so the new route appeared to be successful. Although the American attempts to stop the reinforcement convoys would be temporarily interrupted by Yamamoto's Operation Ego in April, Admiral Halsey would finally continue to harass the Japanese presence in the area by the start of the new month, successfully mining Blackett Strait on May 7th and launching intense airstrikes against the Japanese reinforcement convoys throughout May. On the night of May 12th, Admiral Ainsworth would also take his vessels to launch another naval bombardment of Villa and Munda, the heaviest yet in volume of fire. Kasaka immediately responded by sending a fighter sweep over the Russells, losing four Zeros and destroying five Allied aircraft. And he would also prepare his G4M bombers to start a long campaign against the enemy, by the end of the month launching six night attacks against the airfields on Guadalcanal and the Russells, and four attacks against American shipping. Yet the threat of the renewed American air attacks would ultimately force the Japanese to cancel the final scheduled destroyer runs until late May and early June. Luckily for them, these last reinforcement convoys would suffer no losses, so the defenders would be able to bring in the bulk of the Navy and Army troops assigned to defend New Georgia, along with approximately three months' supply of ammunition and food. Thus the stage was set for the start of another bloody campaign. Next week, however, we have a special episode in store for you, which we hope that you'll absolutely love. If you don't want to miss this episode, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.